Hi, this is Mohamed Hamada, Ravi Guteti, Paul Soraja, and Manos Burlakis, presenting case 110 for the Manual of Percutaneous Coronary Interventions. This is a case of PCI in a patient with severe aortic stenosis before TAVR. The patient was an elderly woman with multiple comorbidities who presented with progressive dyspnea on exertion. Transthoracic echocardiogram demonstrated severe aortic stenosis with a mean trans uh, aortic gradient of 49 millimeters mercury. The ostia of the coronaries were rising at a good height from the aortic annulus, and there was good femoral access bilaterally. There was significant coronary calcification, with coronary angiography demonstrating a severe distal left main lesion, as well as an osteal LAD, as well as a mid LAD lesion at the origin of a sizable diagonal branch. There was no significant lesion into the right coronary artery. The patient was offered surgery with combined aortic valve replacement and coronary bypass, but she refused and uh, was referred for PCI followed by TAVR. What should be the timing of PCI and TAVR? And there are different options. One is to do PCI before, the other is at the same time, and the third is to do the TAVR first. There are advantages and disadvantages of all those approaches. The advantage of doing PCI first is that there is no issue with coronary access that can be difficult to achieve, especially when the core valve is being used. And also there is less contrast than doing combined TAVR and PCI. The disadvantage is that uh, the risk of PCI may be higher in the setting of severe aortic stenosis, and then there is a need for repeat vascular access to perform the um, TAVR, and also this is less convenient for the patient. Another potential issue, if uh, hemodynamic support is being planned with the impeller device, is that impeller use in the setting of a core valve may result in damage of the impeller and suboptimal function. So it is best to not use the impeller in patients who have a core valve, because the struts of the core valve can actually go into the uh, opening of the impeller and damage and break the blades. Eventually, the plan for this patient was to start with PCI by doing balloon valvuloplasty first, inserting an impeller CP device for support, and then performing PCI of the LAD and the circumflex, and then at the second time, perform the TAVR. In terms of PCI, the plan was to first treat the LAD, bifurcation lesion, and then treat the left main lesion. To optimize safety, we decided to start with the right heart catheterization, followed by insertion of the impeller CP, PCI of the mid LAD, and then the left main. Right heart catheterization was done, filling pressures were actually good. And then we, anyway, proceeded with insertion of the impeller, given the substantial risk of the procedure. You used left femoral axis that had a good quality and caliber vessel. We inserted the impeller sheath. There was good flow after inserting the impeller sheath. We always now check flow in the leg after inserting the impeller sheath because sometimes the impeller sheath may actually compromise the flow to the leg, and this is important to know early on before there are any ischemic changes in the leg. One can also use the axis for inserting the guide into the uh, impeller, so minimizing the need for arterial access. We were able to cross uh, the valve uh, using an AL1 and a straight wire, and then uh, we inserted a pigtail into the left ventricle, And then uh, I checked the gradient, which was 45, very similar to the gradient on the transthoracic echo. We performed balloon valvuloplasty with a 22 millimeter ZMET balloon, which uh, significantly decreased the gradient from 45 down to 12 millimeters mercury. So balloon valvuloplasty already has some positive hemodynamic effect. We then inserted the impeller CB device and started with our procedure. The plan was to first treat the middle lady lesion and then uh, go into the left main. The diagonal was of good size, therefore we decided to use a provisional technique, but uh, not uh, do a two-stand technique. It was wired with a workhorse guide wire, 
And then um, we had some difficulty with balloon rupture, as you can see, be seen here, during balloon dilatation of the medial AD. We used an angiosculpt that uh, expanded well, and then stand it across the origin of the diagonal. Unfortunately, there was slow flow after stand deployment with ST segment depression. That is why we decided to try to reaccess the diagonal and perform balloon dilatation. We used a twin pass torque along with a Sion black guide wire. But we had a lot of difficulty advancing a guide wire. And when performing an angiogram, there was actually a large vessel perforation, which is surprising and unusual when we are using essentially a wire, but uh, the wiring attempts here were actually complicated by large vessel perforation. The first step in every perforation is to inflate a balloon to occlude the vessel, and this is exactly what we try to do here. But despite doing that, there seems to be contrast tracking from different planes going outside the coronary lumen. So we reposition the balloon a little more proximal, and then um, after doing that, uh, there was a little better ceiling, but still uh, there was a significant perforation. So we decided to place a cover stand. The advantage of having the PK papyrus stands is that they are lower profile and they can be delivered using the single guide technique. So we still can have the balloon up to minimize bleeding into the pericardium. And at the same time, advance the cover stand. Then uh, what we do is we transiently deflate the balloon, advance the cover stand across the area of the perforation, and then um, remove uh, the blocking balloon, deploy the cover stand, and achieve hemostasis. So this is exactly what was done here. 25 by 26 millimeter papyrus stand that um, successfully sealed the perforation. There was still a distal lesion that was uh, treated um, with um, implantation of uh, another stand. We gave nitroglycerin, this did not improve, so we did not want to take any chances, so we covered it with a drug eluting stent, and that um, gave a nice result as confirmed by IVUS. We did lose the diagonal, but of course, given the emergency, the priority was to restore flow into the LAD. We debated about stopping the procedure here, given the complication, versus continuing with left main PCI, but given the substantial effort and the risk of uh, obtaining again access and placing an impeller device, we decided to go ahead. We did an echocardiogram that demonstrated a small pericardial effusion, but feeling pressures on the swan, which we had actually left during the case, did not show a significant increase in the wedge pressure. There was also a good collapse of the inferior vena cava. So we decided to proceed with the left main PCI. Given the severe calcification of the left main, as well as the LAD and the circumflex, there was essentially a big chunk of calcium at the ostium of the circumflex. The plan was uh, to perform lesion preparation, followed by standing. And this is a case in which uh, we need to place two stands because the side branches are both important and need to be preserved. And then the likelihood of losing them is not insignificant, especially in the setting of severe calcification. The angle here was less than 70 degrees. Therefore, DK crush or culotte are the recommended to stand techniques, with DK crush having uh, some more data. And this is a technique we typically use in our lab for those lesions. To prepare the lesion, we did orbital atherectomy. There is always a concern when performing atherectomy over a bifurcation or about whether we might dissect and uh, compromise flow in the LAD. But if a wire is placed there, there's also the risk of cutting the wire and having distal embolization. So we elected to perform atherectomy into the circumflex without having a wire into the LAD. This was done successfully without any issues of flow compromise into the LAD. Then uh, we rewired into the LAD perform intravascular ultrasounds, and then proceeded with the 17 steps of the DK crush. These are described in a separate video. The first step is to have a balloon in the main vessel. And in this case, we decided to treat the circumflex as the main vessel because wiring to the circumflex was easier 
than wiring into the LED, and we did not want to um, lose access into the circumflex. So we ballooned the circumflex. There is clearly some evidence of dissection into the area of atherectomy and balloon angioplasty. Uh, we ballooned also the LED to make sure that the vessel was expanding well, since uh, sometimes atherectomy might need to be done in that vessel as well. And uh, the next step is to place the stent into the side branch, which in this particular case we decide to be the LED. The stent is protruding a few millimeters into the main vessel, the left main. And after that, the stent is deployed. We do have a balloon in the side branch ready to crush the stent. And then uh, after the balloon was removed, um, the result of the LED was good. There was good flow, and uh, I was showed good expansion. We, th we then crushed uh, the stent into the LED by inflating the balloon we had into the circumflex, and then dilated into the left main. We then rewired the side branch through the crushed stent with a workhorse guide wire, and this is the first kissing balloon inflation with uh, 3.5 millimeter balloons in both vessels. We then inserted uh, a stent uh, into the main vessel, which was the circumflex. We want to make sure that the stent covers both the left main as well as the circumflex. And that was true or multiple views. We clearly cover the circumflex nicely, and the stent is coming essentially all the way to the left main ostium. It's very important to optimally place the stent to avoid too much hanging of the stent into the aorta or potentially missing the lesion distally. After standing into the circumflex, we confirm that we had a nice result with good flow. And then um, we perform the proximal optimization technique with a 4.5 by 8 millimeter non-compliant balloon into the left main. The next plan was to rewire to the LED and do a kissing balloon inflation, but we did have a lot of difficulty delivering a balloon into the LED. To overcome this, we ended up using the anchoring technique by inflating a balloon into the circumflex, which helped deliver the balloon into the LED. We then performed the two-step kiss. We first inflated the balloon in the LED at high pressure, and then we proceeded with the kissing balloon inflation. These are 3.5 millimeter balloons in both the LED as well as the circumflex. We finished by doing the final proximal optimization technique with a 4.5 by 8 millimeter non-compliant balloon into the left main, and then checked with IVOS to ensure that we had a nice um, result, both into the LED as well as into the circumflex, followed by the final angiogram that uh, showed a nice result with T3 flow in both vessels and good angiographic result. The impella was removed at the end of the procedure. The perclose sutures that had been placed before the insertion of the impella were tightened. The patient had slight hypotension that responded to intravenous fluids, and the echo did not show any significant change. Over the next few days, while she was waiting for TAVR, she developed three days later atrial fibrillation, although the previous echoes and hemodynamics were good, on day number three, she had atrial fibrillation, and then repeat echo did actually show an increase in the size of the pericardial effusion, along with dilatation of the inferior vena cava. She underwent pericardiosynthesis, removing 350 ml of blood effusion, and then also she underwent a repeat angiogram to ensure that we did not have any ongoing extravasation of blood, and there was no ongoing bleeding into the pericardium. She subsequently had a TAVR with a 23mm Sapien S3 valve that was also eventful because she subsequently developed left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. So both her procedures were complex with complications. The PCI had the perforation and the TAVR had subsequent LVOT obstruction, but eventually the patient did well and was discharged home in good condition. So to summarize, this is a patient that had a complex uh, clinical course. 
she had severe aortic stenosis as well as severe coronary artery disease. And then the timing can be critical, but the plan here was to perform PCI first, followed by TAVR. To minimize the risk of performing high-risk PCI in a patient with severe aortic stenosis and complex anatomy, we used hemodynamic support after performing aortic balloon valvuloplasty. There was a large vessel perforation that was caused by use of a polymer jacketed wire for rewiring into the side branch while performing LAD PCI. This was treated by inflating a balloon and then by placing a covered stand. Using the PK papyrus stand actually allowed for this treatment to happen with a single guide without having to use a second access and get an additional guide catheter. The left main was performed, uh, uh, was treated uh, successfully using the double kiss and crush technique, treating the circumflex as the main vessel with a nice result. But then the patient did have delayed tamponade three days later. It is hard to know the cause of that. It is possible that uh, there was some slow leak after the procedure, although the angiogram that was done after pericardiocentesis did not demonstrate any ongoing extravasation of blood from the coronary arteries. But eventually, a nice outcome was achieved. She underwent successful tower, and she had a good recovery. Thank you.